All right, welcome everyone to the October 27th Technical Oversight Committee call. Uh, as you are all aware, two things that we must abide by on these call calls. The first is the antitrust policy notice, and the second is the uh, code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. As far as announcements today, we have the standard Dev Weekly developer newsletter that goes out each Friday. If there's something that you would like to reach the hundreds of hyper hyperledger developers, uh, please leave a comment on the uh, the wiki page that is linked in the agenda. The second announcement that we have today is that the TOC nomination period is still open. Uh, the nominations do close on Monday, October 31st. So if you are interested in nominating yourself, please do so. And then Rai, you said you had an announcement? Well, it was an expansion on that announcement. Okay. Um, and that is uh, the people that have nominated themselves, uh, the minority of those have filed an issue uh, with their nominating statement. And I, well, it is in the interest of anyone that nominates themselves to run to add a, uh, to add a nominating statement because that will be linked from the ballot. And uh, if you need help with that, ask in the Discord. Okay, any other announcements? Okay, not seeing any hands or anybody coming off mute. We'll take that as a no. Uh, as far as quarterly reports, uh, the URSA one is in draft. Uh, so uh, last I looked, it still said it was in draft and that we shouldn't review it yet. Uh, as far as the other two, Fabric and Cacti, I haven't seen any specific comments showing up on either of those, uh, but does anybody have any questions that they'd like to bring up at this point? All right, I will we'll take that as a no. Uh, so as far as upcoming reports, we do have the Sawtooth uh, report that is due today. So we'll look to see if that one comes in today. And then we also have the Aries Indiana Roja reports coming due on the 10th of November. Uh, so we'll expect to see those at that point. Any other items that anybody would like to cover before we get to the presentation that we have scheduled for today? Okay, so with no other um, discussion items, we do have the, the folks from the Prune Lab here. Uh, we have Mano and Matias that are here, and they're going to uh, present to us the Prune Lab and uh, walk us through that. So I will hand it off to, uh, to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> then I can share my screen now. Yes, please. Can everyone yeah. see my screen? We can see it. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Manu Ranjit. I work as software engineer at Bosch, and I have been involved with Perun since the beginning days. Uh, Perun is, is a framework that targets uh, um, um, two problems in the blockchain space. Uh, one is blockchain scalability, another one is blockchain interoperability. It's, it started out as an independent project and later became a Hyperledger Labs project, um, and it's collaboratively being developed by Bosch and uh, Polycrypt GmbH. Um, I would like to start uh, with the problem statement that we try to solve. Uh, we are aware that um, um, blockchain provides an excellent mechanism for doing trustless transactions, um, say payments, or in more general terms, exchange of any value. Um, but um, with time, we have seen that there are quite some limitations with this. The first one being limited transaction throughput. For example, if we look at Bitcoin, it has like uh, tens of transactions per second. That's the uh, limit. And there are quite some new chains which have um, uh, improved the uh, layer one scalability, but there's still a, a, a limit on, on, to, on how much we can go far in that respect. So uh, layer two scaling then becomes quite important. 
Um, second is a problem um, where uh, which we figured out along the way as we developed Perun um, that uh, the uh, blockchain networks as new ones come up uh, become the, the network is getting fragmented and, and we need mechanisms to make uh, the networks interoperate with each other and we, we realized that uh, the technology we developed uh, um, which is Perun uh, is usable in this context as well. So these are the two challenges that we target uh, uh, mainly. Uh, coming to the uh, agenda for the presentation. First, I would like to present you uh, an overview of the parent framework, then um, a brief history of the project, and then the interesting applications um, that we see. Yeah, uh, first the overview. Um, to begin with, let's say uh, two participants, Alice and Bob, um, they want to uh, make some transactions. So they come together and, and they talk to each other uh, on what transactions they want to do, what the rules of the transactions are. And once they agree on these terms, um, they also decide what are the allowances for them. For example, in case of a payment channel, it could be that Alice wants to be able to spend uh, 10 units of a currency. So um, they decide all of that and then uh, approach the blockchain to say, we want to open a channel and these are the initial terms of the channel and these are the assets you would like to block in the channel. Then um, the assets are blocked in the parent smart contract and um, the uh, parent channel is open for transaction. Now each of them um, could make any number of transactions uh, in a very direct peer-to-peer -peer manner uh, because these transactions are direct peer-to-peer. -peer, um, there are um, technically no limitations. The only limitations on how fast they can make the transactions are how fast they can uh, create um, new states and creating new states is basically about uh, um, uh, generating data and then making signatures on the data. And the uh, second limitation is how fast is their communication channel. So these are the only two factors that limit them, which means um, they can easily reach thousands of transactions per second uh, with a near zero cost for each of the transactions and the confirmation is immediate. As soon as both these parties sign, then that particular state is valid. And after they make any number of transactions in this fashion, they can go to blockchain and say, um, here is the final state that we uh, agreed on or that we want to settle. And then um, the parent smart contract uh, will uh, validate that state and, and uh, if verify if it's really the final state. And once it confirms that it's a final state, it will settle the channel and redistribute the locked assets according to the final state. So this is what happens with parent state channels. What the protocol provides is that it's probably secure, uh, meaning it has uh, been uh, proven um, in a formal way that um, if um, any state that is generated on the off-chain parent channel uh, can eventually be uh, settled on the blockchain. It only becomes invalid when the next state is created. And um, second thing uh, is uh, cross-chain capability. So in this picture, um, uh, we, we can see that uh, the parent smart contract is just one unit, which means we are using one blockchain backend, but uh, we also figured out that we can use uh, uh, a parent, we can open a parent channel that is simultaneously using two different blockchains. For example, a parent channel which uh, blocks assets um, for Alice on one chain, say Ethereum, and for Bob on another chain, say for um, uh, like Cosmos or something like that. Yeah. So this is an overview of how the parent state channel works. And coming to the implementation part, um, all of these parent protocols um, and that we as, we, as we call the funding protocol, the off-chain uh, communication protocol and the uh, settling protocol, everything is defined, um, is implemented in an abstract uh, way that is independent of any blockchain backend, of any persistence mechanism, and even independent of any uh, networking or serialization um, format used for the off-chain communication. So this uh, is a real abstract and modular um, core of the framework. And into this, we can plug um, different uh, blockchain backends. And I think we currently have five different blockchain backends, um, Ethereum, Cosmos, Polkadot, Internet Computer, and Fabric. And um, for networking and serialization, uh, we, we currently have um, TCP for um, the transport protocol. And, and for serialization, session, we are using uh, a custom format called parent format. And um, recently we also implemented protocol buffers 
So which means um, you can just take the protobuf definitions, generate the stubs, and easily implement um, the parent client in any other language. And for persistence, uh, we currently persist all the off-chain states that are created in a level DB. But again, this is also pluggable. You can go for any other options. Um, so this is the core of the framework. And on top of this, we have a second component, which is Perun node. And Perun node, what it does is that in first place, it um, takes the uh, GoPen framework and configures it according to your use case, picking one of the options for each of the pluggable modules and configuring them in the needed way. And on top of that, it uh, provides an abstraction called session. So what session allows you is that it uh, manages all the channels that a single user has and all the keys and wallets associated with, that with um, all the channels of the user. And additionally, it also uh, maintains a contact list um, on of uh, how to contact each of the peers that the user wants to uh, talk to. Uh, um, their off-chain information it maintains um, all the off-chain information of those peers and um, it provides an easy API um, for the user to open channels with any of these peers and, and then transact on those channels. But this is uh, a more a generic API which is providing all of these functionalities. But if you're looking at a specific use case, say payments, for example, then on top of this session API, uh, we provide another API layer, which is payments um, API layer, which is providing like really simple APIs um, allowing you to specify only the data that is required for payments. And um, this payment API can either be um, accessed as a library, um, like a Go library or anything, or if, if you want a scenario where you want access it over remote interface, then you can just implement a gRPC adapter. So this is also existing right now and so on. So this is like really the extensible um, component of, of the whole uh, parent framework where um, depending on your use case, you can just implement uh, lighter API layers without uh, modifying the protocol or the um, session um, layer. So that's the interesting way in way in which the whole core of the protocol can be extended by using plugins and the uh, framework can be more usable or tailored to use case by writing appropriate um, APIs in the only in the upper layers. Yeah, so this is an overview of uh, the two components of parent framework. Um, and now uh, we come to project history. Uh, we started um, in 2018 uh, with the uh, publication of parent search paper. This was published uh, by um, Professor Sebastian Faust and a uh, few of his colleagues from TU Darmstadt uh, in collaboration with another university. And um, then uh, Bosch joined um, with them to collaborate on the development of the uh, parent framework um, in 2019. And from there, uh, we had several milestones um, before we eventually became a Hyperledger Labs project in, in late 2020. And from there, um, it has also been interesting that we developed a lot in terms of the uh, framework functionalities. Uh, and we even presented a few demos in Hyperledger in-depth series. And um, as I told that uh, we um, have several other backends like Polkadot and Cosmos, we also collaborate with um, the corresponding um, communities as well. So, so this is um, how we, our collaboration looks like in, in time. And finally, I would like to um, discuss some of the uh, applications that we find interesting and that we have experimented with so far. First of them is Perun IoT state channels. Uh, this was also one of the uh, initial use cases uh, which we had in mind for Bosch. Um, um, like how do we enable um, two devices to make transactions based on blockchain? So that was one of the um, um, initial questions that we had in mind. And um, the Perun um, uh, state channels that we developed, uh, we extended it further. Um, and, and the reason that we needed to extend it is for that uh, the IoT devices um, that are here can have like real limitations on, on compute memory or network um, interactions or even power consumption. Like they can always not be connected to internet or and so on. And so we, uh, it, is, uh, it is tricky to uh, expect that the device is able to do um, all the blockchain interactions by itself. So we thought about a key uh, parameter for, for, for IoT devices, which is that uh, each IoT device is owned by an owner or a user. If it's by a company, then it's administered by some person. So then we said, let's um, build some protocols to outsource all the blockchain interactions of the device to this owner or administrator. And this device is then interacting only with the other device that it wants to transact with and with the user never with the blockchain and and these protocols uh, we released um, uh, in our recent releases and we also presented an extensive talk on the peron iot state chance itself um, in the last week uh, 
so that is um, the uh, first use case that I want to discuss. Uh, the second one is uh, blockchain gaming at low latency. So this is a very interesting use case. Um, Ayuna is, is a block is a blockchain uh, gaming infrastructure provider in the Polkadot ecosystem. What they were having in mind is that they wanted to build a game that works completely on blockchain. Like it, 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 it every move that is done is stored on the blockchain. And this means um, games are usually fast and, and re need like real time con confirmation of transactions. And this is quite not possible in the layer one. So they were looking at um, um, a, a layer, a very uh, low latency layer for implementing their game logic layer, which is recording these transactions and eventually recording it on blockchain. And that's where um, Perun was a very uh, interesting fit. Um, and this is like work in progress. And if you have more questions, we could also discuss about it in, in, in the discussion section. The next use case is uh, trustless uh, cross-chain asset swap. So here, um, as I said, uh, in the, when discussing the concept of Perun channel, um, let's say there's a client um, who um, has an asset on Ethereum, and then there's a liquidity provider who has an asset on Polkadot. And now um, these two people want to exchange their assets. So what they can do is they can open a Perun um, channel, blocking their corresponding assets on the corresponding chains. So the client will block their asset on Ethereum, and the liquidity provider will block their asset on Polkadot. And then they can also give each other the addresses on the chain. For example, liquidity provider will give the address to which um, they want the asset to be transferred on Ethereum and vice versa. And after this channel is opened, what they can do is they can create a state which is swapping the assets. So it is swapping the asset ownership between the client and liquid provider in a single atomic um, transaction. And then they can finalize the state and again, settle it on the corresponding chains um, where the uh, smart contract will then um, swap the assets for them um, on the uh, corresponding chains. So this way um, it's very cheap um, and, and uh, trustless token swap because you're now not relying on any intermediate party like a bridge or something. And next use case is a trustless credential payment. Uh, this is uh, similar to the uh, trustless cross, cross assets, cross chain asset swap. But then the difference is here, one of the asset is a piece of data, maybe a decentralized ID or something, which is issued by an authority. And the other asset is the payment for it. Um, so um, both of them can block the um, corresponding assets in the parent channel and inside of the channel, they can swap it in an atomic way and then settle it again on a chain. Um, which means again, this is, is atomic in nature. And uh, because it is done off chain, um, it can be like really thousands of transactions per second, as, as we uh, said. And I think we implemented a POC um, in the, on this, which is available on the internet, which you can try out. Um, and currently uh, we are also working uh, to integrate this into the Hyperledger ARIS framework. That brings us to the end of the presentation. And to summarize, I think Perun, uh, we would like to call it as a toolkit for blockchain scalability and interoperability uh, using the state channel technology. And the key um, advantages that, that it offers is uh, low latency, modularity, and it's on, based on peer reviewed research and, and formal proofs. Um, and uh, as a good segue into discussion section, I think uh, one of the interesting uh, things you would like to discuss is uh, possible opportunities for collaboration uh, within the Hyperledger ecosystem. And, and what we saw based on interactions uh, during the global forum was that uh, two projects, Hyperledger Cactus and Firefly, uh, might be interesting, uh, um, I mean, ha might have interesting avenues for collaboration. But then we are looking forward for your inputs as well on how to uh, think about this. All right, thanks for that. Uh, so I have an initial question to kick us off and then uh, hopefully we'll get some other questions as well. I'm curious yep, about sure. the, the roadmap for uh, the Prune framework. You know, uh, when we are looking at the history, um, it kind of, you know, peaked in my mind that, you know, I'm curious as to what's next. Um, what are the plans for additional chains or additional uh, sort of work that's going on there? Yeah, I think in terms of roadmap, uh, one of the um, things that we are currently looking at is IoT state channels. Uh, what we demonstrated in the, in the um, recently is the ability to um, use the main framework um, uh, on devices like Raspberry Pi or little more capable IoT devices. So one of the things we want to do is develop a light client which can work on like real um, um, like low embedded devices which are like running bare metal or um, 
or running an Arthos kind of systems. So that is one of the areas that we want to go forward. And uh, maybe Matthias or Henrik can highlight on some other areas that we are looking forward for. Um, yeah, sure. Maybe I can uh, extend this a bit. So we are currently also working on um, extending the Prune framework to other blockchains. Uh, so for example, right now in progress is Cardano. So this demonstrates that the Prune framework is also uh, can be applied to EU ticks or uh, star blockchains. Um, and yeah, we're also in talks with uh, th further blockchain ecosystems um, for next year. Then, um, yeah. Mano highlighted the SSI use case. So we recently in this October started a project on integrating this into uh, the ARIES um, framework. And this is a project that we uh, yeah, uh, plan for the next two years. And it's also partially funded by a state grant from uh, the German uh, state government. And uh, yeah, then we are also uh, continuing on uh, the gaming use case that Mano highlighted with uh, the folks from Ayuna network. And yeah, then of course, um, we also uh, intend to, uh, we are open for um, yeah, becoming um, a full hyperledger project. So for that, there are a lot of things that, that need to be done. For example, uh, streamlining the naming, streamlining the repositories, documentation, uh, create more traction in terms of marketing and also create more traction in terms of the applications um, as they are currently in a yeah, POC state and we are trying to also bring them uh, into production. So this is kind of a, a summary. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Arun. Hey, thanks, uh, Manor Ranjit. This, was, this is a really nice project and I'm actually personally looking forward to a project like this. Um, it's really yeah. beneficial for the community. And I have two questions, probably to kick it off. I, my first question is from the interoperability angle, right? Yeah. Um, so can you elaborate a bit more on that? So when you talk about interoperability, it's not actually providing a set uh, transfer mechanism across blockchain. It's rather uh, pegging mechanism on the same blockchain, but the Perun node itself is um, adaptable across blockchain. Is that correct understanding? Um, no, maybe I can go back to that area one moment. Uh, yeah, so so what happens is that uh, um, you can have um, two different contracts. So say one contract is on Polkadot and one contract is on Ethereum. And then uh, when um, you come together um, in opening the channel, so during the initial interaction, you say that um, 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 liquidity provider has the asset on Polkadot and client has the asset on Ethereum and they're going to block and swap it. So all of this is agreed in the first transaction. And uh, when uh, we have to fund this channel, um, we fund it on both the chains. So on both these smart contracts, uh, we um, um, block the assets and, and um, then uh, only the channel becomes open. And uh, once the channel is open, you do the first transaction, which is also the last transaction, which is swapping the assets. And once you create that state, that state can be used um, to claim um, the assets by the other user on both the chains. So that way it's, it's an asset swap, not uh, pegging. So a single channel is, is uh, by you're actually swapping the ownership of the asset in the in off chain because in off chain is a single medium and it can be done in an atomic manner and then you go back and settle claim your assets back on the chain. Got it. Thanks, Manor Um, I'll read more about it. So my second yeah. question is on 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 the use cases so far that uh, probably I'm a little outdated when I last saw uh, the Peru note. All the examples that I could find were with two parties. I remember there was some kind of implementation where it, the multi-party aspect of it was it to be supported, right? Any yes. um, suggestions or any inputs on that? Uh, no, I think um, currently um, it's mostly two-party uh, uh, framework. So currently, mostly we support two-party transactions, uh, but the protocol itself is not the uh, limitation. I think the protocol is extensible for multi-party um, channels, but uh, we, since most use cases currently we are interested in or the community is interested is in it is involving only two parties, we are going in the direction. So most of the examples are two-party examples. But the protocol itself um, is, is not having the limitation. Yeah, Thanks. and I can add also the implementation is written in a way that the data structures are already multi-party. Um, but we didn't write the protocol communication um, 
implementation are already for multi-party. So kind of the data structures already are, uh, and depending on the protocol, for example, the funding protocol or the off-chain transaction protocol, we would have to extend these protocols uh, to communicating um, with multiple parties, uh, maybe integrating a broadcast uh, functionality or something like that. So this part is, is not there, but the core is written in a way that it is extensible if we decide to do that. Got it. Thanks. Um, thanks for answering that. I, I don't know, I could probably hold on to this question later, but the later question that I had was in terms of, are you guys thinking to bring the project uh, to Hyperledger incubation and um, how many com contributors are currently helping you maintain the project and all other aspects? Are. So I'll hold on to that question. Maybe you can address that later. Yeah, okay. Maybe we'll uh, take the other questions and then come to that uh, later on time. Sounds good. Peter? Thank you, Tracy. Thanks for the presentation. I wanted to know about uh, the opening of the channel. Does that require a transaction on layer one to open the channel? Yes, it does. Okay, and then the cost of that is that paid by Allison Bob from the charts. Yeah. Gotcha. And uh, one more quick one uh, for the asset exchanges: is that based or are those contracts uh, are HTLCs, or or there's some other mechanism to to return funds if uh, no, these bad. are um, yeah. These are uh, based on state channel technology. So um, it's it's comparable in a way to HTLC that you have this locking mechanism, but it's different to HTLC that it works based on signatures. So you can almost think of a channel in a way as, as a multi-sig contract. Um, so as soon as all the participants agree on the new channel state, for example, transferring a token from one party to another, then the contract recognizes this as a creed, as opposed to an HTLC, which depends on this uh, secret value that you have to reveal. And this has also the, um, the benefit that we're not limited to one transaction, but we can do multiple updates. So you can do as many updates as you like before you settle the channel, where in HTLC-based, swaps you can only do one gotcha and the the source code of this contract is that also open source in the lab project yes yeah, it's all, are. all open source yeah nice okay then the last thing not not a question just comment on one of the maintainers of cactus or cacti sorry and okay. uh, I would be definitely interested in collaborating, trying to figure out how we can work together and achieve interoperability even more. Okay, yeah, that sounds interesting. Probably we could also talk after the uh, um, TOC meeting. Okay, sounds good, thank you. All right, thanks, Peter. Angelo. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, for the presentation. My, my my comment is more on 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 the on on the side of the the project. Is if if it makes sense to uh, to have a fast track for Perun to get into Cacti instead of having Perun as another hyperledger project, because uh, you know also to have clarity of uh, the uh, the ecosystem. If if now we know that there is a hyperledger cacti that is a project uh, that contains multiple uh, uh, multiple techniques uh, that offers multiple techniques to achieve inter uh, achieve interoperability. Uh, to me, Perun is another one in this uh, in this direction. So I, I my first instinct would be to suggest this path to get Perun inside cacti. Uh, directly, instead of having it as a, a new hyperledger project. Thank you. Okay. 
yeah probably um, we can have a look into it like uh, what are the possibilities there yeah i, I could also see that um i i don't have uh, the biggest words in that of course but um I, I yeah through the discussions at the global forum, I also had the impression that Cacti has like several protocols uh, included, but none of them is a state channel based. So state channels could add something to Cacti, um, some additional functionality which is not there yet. So I could see a fit there, but maybe yeah we would also have to look at. Um, other aspects of such an integration, like how compatible are the code bases and the architectures and so on. But yeah, I, 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 I agree with um, the idea that it could make sense. Yeah, yeah. it would be it would be definitely a faster uh, track. That's uh, th th that's for sure. So you don't have to to find other organizations that you will have uh, the, 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 that needs to be uh, maintainers of the Perun repository and so on and so forth. So there is already a community around Cacti. So why not that? Yeah, and yeah. you know, I think I think the the key here, right, is to have these connections. So. Um, Peter has obviously worked with other um, other labs, right, uh, to bring into uh, to Hyperledger Cactus to become Cacti, right. So I think it's it's definitely a good place to start with those conversations. See how likely it is that it makes sense, and um, I know Peter's definitely up for that. I saw the the thumbs up that Peter gave, so um, definitely let's let's continue those conversations and see what makes sense. Kamlesh? Yeah, that really sounds like a very interesting uh, um, avenue for, for going forward. So I think the same like, like Angelo mentioning like you and uh, other like, uh, uh, instead of having a separate project, it could be maybe clubbed with Cacti, because like, like we were in Cactus, where it could be has some, some uh, different way of uh, interoperability in the blockchain protocols. Thanks, Kamlesh. Other questions, Arun? Uh, right. So I have slightly contradictory statement to what Angelo and you guys are proposing right now in terms of merging it to Cacti. Um, so, so far, I have been treating Cacti purely as interop solution when I needed that interoperability aspect. Uh, but looks like Perun does have additional capabilities which would spill over beyond interop scope. So um, that's all. Just wanted to bring out that point. Uh, yeah, um, thanks for uh, bringing up this point. So so I think uh, one of the um, um, thoughts I have in mind as, as I hear the comments is, is uh, one. Um, um, definitely, there is um, a, um, a way, of, um, um, like um, a good um, um, synchrony to work with Cacti, um, because um, both are addressing interoperability in one way. But I think Perun itself has um, uh, some other directions. For example, IoT state channels, where um, it's 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 not about interoperability, but about um, just scalability and and so on. So uh, um, I think. Um, um, having a closer look and having more discussions with the team would provide a clear understanding of what's uh, possible. Thanks. Yeah, I look forward yeah. to outcomes of those discussions. But yeah, I'm pretty much excited if collaboration does happen. I see there is definite uh, possibility for it. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. And um, coming back to the question um, that you raised in the beginning, Arun, I think um, in terms of becoming um, um, a main hyperledger project, a um, um, few things uh, are housekeeping things, which Matthias described in the beginning, like bringing together different repositories and, and doing housekeeping around the code and something. Um, um, but um, in other aspects, uh, we see um, two other um, um, fronts for um, to achieve before we can become main project. One is um, to see a uh, fit with other hyperledger projects and how do we collaborate and so on. Um, and um, second is, is to find a use case or a third uh, contributor. I think currently it's it's mostly Bosch and Polyclip that's working on this. Probably if, if we find a, a third uh, um, um, entity that is also finding this technology interesting, probably it could be a, a more stronger project when it um, as a main project, maybe um, your thoughts on this.
Yeah, so uh, I guess the, the question is, have we had projects that have come in with only two, um, two organizations that have had maintainers? Um, and I'm not sure I'd have to go take a look at the original um, project proposals and see where they were. Um, I, I do think that you know our incubation entry criteria probably outlines what is suggested. Um, and, and then it's a, a matter of you know seeing how well those uh, those criteria are, are met. I think it's it's really um, you know if you read that document, it really kind of highlights the the expectations of things that we've seen in the past um, when it when it comes to how we have approved projects into Hyperledger. So uh, probably worth taking a look at that if you haven't already. Yeah. Okay. And I'm I'm happy to share that link uh, directly in the um, in the prune chat so that you guys have access to that and can take a look at kind of where you think you stand related to that. Yeah, sure, I, I that'd do. Be really helpful. I, yeah, I mean, I do find it interesting, right, in looking at kind of the the history, right, when we looked at that slide, the the number of kind of collaborations that you've had with other sorts of organizations or chains or you know there, there was definitely some some sort of collaboration happening there and I'm curious as to whether or not any of those sorts of groups that you've worked with would um, you know be willing or, or able to also participate in contributing and maintaining the code so that could be another sort of uh, avenue or, or venue that you take a look at um, you know with the the other sorts of groups that you've done collaboration with Okay, yeah, that, that that's also one possibility. Yeah, Angelo? Yeah, no, just no, no, to, to be honest, what Arun said it makes a lot of sense because if, if Perun, the main focus of Perun is uh, layer two um, and uh, performance, uh, that probably deserves a, a, a dedicated space in the, in the, in the greenhouse. Uh, that, that in, in that case, yes, from the point of view of layer two, we don't have any anything that speaks directly to uh, for layer two. And given uh, the level of uh, uh, integration with with blockchains that Perun has already, uh, yeah, that would uh, that would uh, in my eyes would, that would qualify as a as a as a hyperledger project with that target so la layer two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for your input. Uh, and just FYI, I did just look at uh, the incubation entry considerations. Uh, it says the project should have multiple maintainers. These maintainers need not be from different companies. However, having maintainers from different companies is seen as a positive sign. Proposals with only one maintainer have been rejected by prior TOCs. Um, so, I, I, you know, there is sort of precedence, I think. Uh, and okay. it's just a question of, you know, I, what the, what it looks like as far as the the actual growth of the the lab and uh, how that's looking. So, you know, uh, I I would say based on our, our considerations, it's not an immediate no, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the quick uh, input on that point. Yeah, and I did I did add the link to the Prune channel so that you guys can take a look at that uh, in yeah. in depth. Other questions. No. Any closing thoughts uh, from the Prune team? Yeah, I think um, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, TOC for the opportunity. It was quite an uh, insightful discussion for us in terms of how we, um, how the um, TOC sees this project uh, from their point of view and the way forward. Uh, so thanks for your time and thanks for listening. All right, thanks. And it looks like Arun maybe has a uh, another question or a comment. Right, I do have one more question. So, out of curiosity, just because of uh, the integration that it's for, that uh, the parent project has made with other frameworks outside of um, Hyperledger ecosystem. So, how, what is the interest that is seen in other communities that you have observed in terms of adoption or the project interest itself? 
Uh, this is a question out of curiosity. You may choose to ignore or if you have any thoughts on that, feel free to share them. Um, maybe I can say a few words on this. Um, so state channels were one of the early scaling technologies and they have um, specific use cases where they are interesting. So especially when you want to go towards low latency and I think um, the other communities are all interested in layer two solutions and that's why they funded our project as one layer layer two solution for their um, for their community for their um, blockchain space and at the moment um, i think we are now looking more towards applications and one interesting aspect or one interesting application was for example the collaboration or is the ongoing collaboration with Ayuna where we already did one grant project um, regarding bringing state channels into the gaming space and enabling low latency interactions there um, so overall I would say first of all we are kind of an infrastructure technology provider which is a toolkit and now we are in all of these communities going more and more into the direction what can we do with it and looking for collaborations in that regard thanks appreciate the inputs all right any any last questions All right. If there's no questions, then I would like to thank Mano, Matthias, and Hendrik for joining us today on the call. I think this has been a really interesting presentation and, and discussion. I uh, I am curious to see how the, the continued conversations might go with Cacti and whether or not it makes sense to to bring that into Cacti or whether it makes sense to bring this into uh, a separate pro top level project as we move forward. So. Definitely uh, keep us informed as you move forward with those conversations and, and let us know how it goes. And with that, I am going to close the call for today. So I thank you all for attending and we will hopefully see you next week. Yep. Thank you very much for having thank us. You all. Thank you. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. Have a good day.